Although I've talked about the recent attempts to keep Donald Trump off the 2024 ballot on the radio program, I realize I haven't taken the time to do an in-depth episode here. I apologize for taking so long to broach this extremely important topic in this venue. Unless you've been hiding from everything politics in the United States, you're aware that there are actors in several states that have sued in their state courts to disqualify Donald Trump from being on their state's primary election ballot for president of the United States. As of this writing, in only two states, Colorado and Maine, have those actors found some measure of success. While the Supreme Court has decided to hear this case, um, this truly is a states' rights issue, even though it has national importance. So we'll look at this next on the Constitution Study. Hello there, Everyday Americans. Paul Engel here with the Constitution Study. Yes, this is where you read and study the Constitution, teach your rights and generation to be free. This is going to be one of those things we're going to spend a lot of time because a lot of this has constitutional questions that we have to deal with. Now, if you want to learn more about the Constitution, we can find more at the website constitutionstudy.com. I'll talk a bit more at the end of the program, but right now I want to get into this question of the 14th Amendment and Donald Trump's disqualification from office. We begin with the basis of the multiple claims that Donald Trump is ineligible to hold federal office under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States. Most of these suits have been filed by a single person, John Anthony Castro, a candidate for the Republican nomination for president with an extremely small chance of success. To date, Mr. Castro has filed suits in Arizona, Idaho, Kansas, Montana, Nevada, New Hampshire, North Carolina, South Carolina, Utah, and West Virginia. Interesting enough, it does not appear that Mr. Castro has filed suit in his home state of Texas. In addition, the group Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington has filed suit in Colorado, and Robert Davis has filed suit in Michigan. Meanwhile, the Secretary of State of Maine has determined under state law that Donald Trump is ineligible to be on the ballot because of his participation in the events in the Capitol on January 6th. Now, while there are subtle differences between these suits, they are all based in a claim that Donald Trump is ineligible to hold federal office for participating in an insurrection on January 6th, 2021. When most people think of the 14th Amendment, they generally focus on the first section. That covers things like citizenship, due process, and equal protection of the law. While the argument being made in the states comes out of Section 3. No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president or hold any office, civil or military, under the United States or under any state who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or an executive or judicial officer of any state to support the Constitution of the United States, shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. But Congress may, by two-thirds vote of each House, remove such disability. Well, the most basic question that should be asked is, did Donald Trump incite, assist, or engage in a rising or rebellion against the Constitution of the United States? There are other things that need to be considered as well. I'm sure some of you are wondering, does Mr. Castro, a resident of Texas, have standing to bring suits in these other states? The short answer is yes. As a candidate for the Republican nomination for the presidential election, it's expected that Mr. Castro would logically compete for the votes in all 50 states. Therefore, if Mr. Trump is ineligible for office in any, it would increase what little chance Mr. Castro has of winning delegates in that state. Now, one of the arguments being made is that Donald Trump is not subject to Section 3 because the office of president is not listed. See, Section 3 reads, No person shall be a senator or representative in Congress or elector of president and vice president. The 14th Amendment lists three offices elected by the people of the United States, senator, representative, and elector for president and vice president. Since neither the president nor the vice president are elected by the people, They are not included in this part of the list. However, that's not the entire list. No person shall hold any office, civil or military, 
under the United States. This is where things get a little tricky. Some people claim that the president is not a civil officer. Now, the Free Legal Dictionary defines a civil officer. By this term, we include all officers of the United States who hold their appointments under the national government, whether their duties are executive or judicial, in the highest or lowest departments of the government, with the exception of officers in the Army and Navy. Therefore, the president is not subject to Section 3, but that's not what the Constitution says. Remember, Section 3 reads, No person shall hold any office, civil or military, under the United States. It seems difficult to say that the office of the president is not an office under the United States, which the Free Legal Dictionary defines as, An office is a right to exercise a public function or employment and to take the fees and emoluments belonging to it. There's one other area where I see a lot of misunderstanding when it comes to Section 3 of the 14th Amendment, and that is the need to have previously taken an oath, who, having previously taken an oath as a member of Congress or as an officer of the United States or as a member of any state legislature or as an executive or judicial officer of any state, to support the Constitution of the United States. Just because someone has participated in insurrection or rebellion does not disqualify them from holding office under the 14th Amendment. They must have previously taken an oath to support the Constitution of the United States as a member of Congress, an officer of the United States, or as a member of the state legislature or officers of any state. I don't know of anyone claiming that Donald Trump did not take an oath to support the Constitution of the United States when he assumed the office of president, but it does shoot holes in the claim that the presidency is not an office of the United States. Which leads us to the crux of the matter. Did Donald Trump engage in insurrection or rebellion? That is a requirement of Section 3. Shall have engaged in insurrection or rebellion against the same, or given aid or comfort to the enemies thereof. The entire argument rests on the claim that the events of January 6, 2021 was an insurrection. That Donald Trump helped to organize the event, and that when he said, I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. He really meant for people to overturn the government of the United States, to overthrow the Constitution. After all, that is what an insurrection is, a rising rebellion of citizens against their government, usually manifested by acts of violence. Under federal law is a crime to incite, assist, or engage in such conduct against the United States. Since Donald Trump spoke to the group that would walk from the ellipse to the Capitol, It'd be difficult to say that he did not engage in the demonstration. And though he did acknowledge that people would be walking to the Capitol, he neither encouraged them to do so nor act in any illegal fashion. Acknowledging that people would be peacefully and patriotically assembling to petition their representatives for a readers of the grievances they perceived was in no way an attempt to rebel against their government. Since at least five states violated the Constitution by appointing electors for president, in a manner other than the one determined by their state legislature? They were asking their members of Congress to enforce the Constitution, which created the government of the United States, even though the government of those states refused to do so. The cases against Donald Trump are fundamentally based on a misunderstanding. Granted, that misunderstanding has been promulgated and promoted by supporters of a political agenda. It's a misunderstanding nonetheless. That the government of the United States is sovereign and therefore above the law. The government of the United States did not create the United States. Both the United States and its governments are a creation of a compact between the states, the Constitution. No action by the United States is the supreme law of the land unless it is founded on the Constitution of the United States, at least according to Article 6, Clause 2, the Supremacy Clause, which reads, This Constitution and the laws of the United States which shall be made in pursuance thereof and all treaties made or which shall be made under the authority of the United States shall be the supreme law of the land. To claim that the demonstrations on January 6, 2021 was an insurrection requires the assumption that political parties are the authority in the United States, at least according to Noah Webster, who defines an insurrection as arising against civil or political authority, the open and active opposition of a number of persons to the execution of a law in a city or state. For a rising in the United States to be insurrection, it must be against a legitimate civil or political power. As I've already shown, at least five states were exercising an illegitimate power to appoint electors for president. Since the manner of choosing them was established by the judicial or executive branch of the state government, not its legislature. 
Furthermore, the vast majority of the crowd was not looking to overturn the Congress or even the presidency, but what was evidently the flawed and corrupt election in several of the states. Even those who were convinced that Donald Trump had won and wanted him installed as president were not committing insurrection, since they were not trying to remove someone from office, but questioning the process by which he would be placed in it. How can the United States call itself a republic if the people in whom that sovereign power comes are not allowed to question the elections of their representatives? How can a calling for following the supreme law of the land be an insurrection against the law and the government it created? Add to all this the obvious political biases in everything from the reporting on the event to the claims made by the political actors. After all, when thousands shut down highways, burned effigies, and stated that Donald Trump is not by president, no one claimed they were committing insurrection. When violent demonstrations rampaged through Washington, D.C. in 2020, including the setting of fires across the street from the White House, those who called for such demonstrations were not accused of insurrection. While the 14th Amendment does not require someone to be convicted of insurrection, it does claim someone must have engaged in such a thing. In the United States, we are supposed to have due process. That includes the assumption of innocence and the government bearing the burden of proof. Yet to date, the only proof provided in support of this claim of insurrection have been misquotes, misrepresentations, and outright lies about the actions of the majority of demonstrators. Yes, some did force their way through a barrier, but that is trespassing, not insurrection. There is video evidence that the majority of those who entered the Capitol did so peacefully, and with the consent of the Capitol Police officers there at the time. Congress was not forcibly removed, but evacuated due to an abundance of caution. In fact, Congress returned later that day to observe the rest of the counting of the votes by the electors for president. So who has engaged in insurrection? While those who have harassed the people for their sin of being in Washington, D.C. on January 5th through 7th have committed crimes, insurrection is not one of them. Those agents of the federal government who have used abusive force, including heavily armed teams with overwhelming firepower, to take someone into custody for nonviolent and misdemeanor allegations have committed crimes, but not insurrection. Even those who are in the media or who question who is and is not in the office of the president isn't a challenge to the government, isn't insurrection. While some of the actors in this drama we've been reviewing may come close, Insurrection must be a rejection of the government, not of those in office. Otherwise, the United States is just another banana republic, run by emotions rather than the rule of law. George Washington warned us in his farewell address, what would happen if we allow our political partisanship to rule our emotions? He said, the alternate domination of one faction over another, sharpened by the spirit of revenge, natural to party dissension, which in different ages and countries has perpetuated the most hard enormities, is itself a frightful despotism. If we continue down this road, then insurrection will no longer be political hyperbole used to promote an agenda. It will lead to something much, much worse. Again, George Washington said, it serves always to distract the public councils and enfeeble the public administration. It agitates the community with ill-founded jealousies and false alarms, kindles the animosity of one part against another, foments occasionally riot and insurrection. You see, it's our political hatred, our political revenge, our political dissension that has led us to this state of, of ill-founded jealousy, false alarms, and yes, animosity to the point of insurrection. Is that the future you want for your children? These cries of insurrection are the partisanship speaking. It's the natural dissension common to party politics, writ large. And we were warned about it, and we're falling for it. Listen, love Trump, hate Trump, it doesn't matter. What he did was not insurrection. What the people on January 6th did was not insurrection. They were not attempting to overturn the Constitution, as required by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. They were complaining about an election that has proven to be, well, let's say have some issues. Just watch 2,000 Mules or look at the reports on what happened in Georgia and Pennsylvania and Michigan. Oh, and Arizona while we're at it. See, if you're not allowed to question an election, we're not a republic anymore. And while there were actors that acted poorly, they, they violently trespassed, they assaulted people, they should be charged for those crimes. We shouldn't turn that disagreement into insurrection. 
Because if we do, and if we do like some people are asking, see, there are people saying, if they're going to do this to Trump, well, then we should do it to Biden. That's the end of the republic. It's the end of trust in any election ever again. The republic is dead. Long live the tyranny. And let's face it, I don't think we want to live under tyranny. Now, if you want to find out more, if you want to ask a question and get more information, well, please head to the website constitutionstudy.com. You can sign up for one of my mailing lists. You can buy a book, maybe donate to the cause, or just, like I said, ask a question. It's all there. I do this to help people better defend and assert their rights, to help them read and study the Constitution for themselves. And if you can support me or if you want to be part of it, please let me know. Check out the Patriots program if you want to learn how to take these ideas and put them into action. Not for a new group, but to help whatever group or movement you support do their job better. Most of all, let's not get wrapped up in the party politics. Let's not hate somebody because they're a donkey or an elephant. Let us allow people to live free. Let us enjoy the blessings of liberty by not denying them to others. If that's an idea you can get along with, well, come back here and join us next time for the Constitution Study. 